Welcome everyone, this is Gihan Pereira and welcome to this online presentation where we've got 45 minutes to explore what it means to have a, have a mindset for the future and uh, I've called this Future Mind and we're looking at what sort of mindset do we need to be able to, to cope with the challenges of the, the massive uncertainty and change and disruption that we're going through at the moment. So um, make the most of this 45 minutes, please engage, I want to make this interactive there'll be the chance for you to share in the chat room to share with the other people in the room to share with me um i might even do a little magic trick seeing how we go and uh, it'll be the chance for you to have 45 minutes to think a little bit about the future because i think we spend a lot of time thinking about the present but we should be spending a lot of time thinking about the future as well because we're all on a one-way trip into the future and i think the more senior you are the more you're being paid to spend your time thinking about the future and it's very easy to get caught up in the day-to-day -day what's going on around us today. So we're going to talk about the, the skills and the mindset that we need for the future. So very broadly, uh, in terms of the, the three things, the three learning strategies I want to share with you. First of all, I want to share with you some of the skills for the future so that we can be more future ready. We'll never be future proof. We can't be future proof, uh, but we can be future ready. Um, the next thing is I want to share with you, go a bit broader and talk about some of the mindsets for the future. And the third thing is then help you just create a very broad uh, learning path for your, for your future learning. But I know that we've gone through a lot of disruption and chaos and change at the moment and it's affecting different people in different ways. So I want to start by just asking how you're feeling. And I'm going to keep this anonymous and the way to do this is by doing it as a poll. So I've got this poll question. We're going to run a few polls through the session. And the first one is this one. Uh, how are you feeling? Just in a word or two or a short phrase, how are you feeling? Now, there are two ways that you can get to the poll. Uh, one is the old fashioned way, which is you can type in, uh, open up your smartphone and type in askgihan.com into Safari or, or Google. Um, the other way of doing it, which not a lot of people know, is that we've got this, this QR code, the quick response code, and uh, some people don't know that you can actually hold up your phone, open the camera app, hold it up to the QR code, and if you've got a newish uh, version phone, uh, either an iPhone or an Android phone, then it will automatically uh, give you the choice to go to askihan.com. So use either of those two things to go to askihan.com and the poll question should be there ready for you and it's saying how are you feeling. And, uh, so, uh, yeah, it's interesting now, overwhelmed, I'm not surprised that that's, uh, uh, that's the biggest one and the most common response, but there's a whole bunch of others that are like that. People are feeling tired and sad and flat uh, and equally there are some people who are feeling optimistic and positive and even I can see buoyant in there. Um, and the reason I want to start with that is for two reasons. One is I really did want to know, I do want to know how you're feeling because it's a challenging time for many people around Australia and around the world. Um, the second reason is when we're talking about learning strategies and thinking about the future, uh, I always think about that, that old saying, uh, excuse the sexist language, give a man a fish, you feed him for a day, uh, teach him how to fish and you feed him for a lifetime. And thinking about lifelong learning is very much about teaching him how to fish. But when people are going through crisis and disruption, sometimes the best thing you can do is give them a fish. And so what we talk about in the next 40 minutes, um, just keep that in mind, that use it as a filter for everything that we talk about. Sometimes we're talking about how do we teach them how to fish, but sometimes the best thing you can do for somebody is to give them a fish. And that somebody might be you. So sometimes maybe you just need a quick fix. Sometimes you need the long-term learning strategy. And I know there are a lot of um, leaders and managers uh, here today. So uh, you can think of this in two ways. And I recommend that when we look at these learning strategies, uh, do this for yourself, be a bit selfish, do it for yourself, but also I'm sure you, you can think about how you can apply these for your team as well. Okay, so let's let's now look at uh, the first of these learning strategies, which is all about uh, the skills for the future. So what skills do we need for the future? Um, I'm going to start this with a little bit of a, a little bit of an interactive activity uh, because, well, we're going to talk about the future today, but I want to take you back first into the past. Because once upon a time, um, there was a thing called international travel. Uh, some of you are old enough to remember it. And... 
Of course, many people are now looking forward to borders opening and being able to travel again. Not everybody, but a lot of people are. And I also know there are a lot of people in the room today who are in the travel industry. And so I want to ask you, where should we go? And I'm not going to make this about you. I'm not asking where you might like to go uh, when we open up our borders again. Uh, I'm going to be a bit selfish here. And uh, I'm actually going to ask somebody in the travel industry, if you're in the room, to help me decide where should I go. And in fact, it's not just I, it's uh, myself and and my fiance Nikki, um, when when we go on our honeymoon, when we get married, um, so two years ago, almost two years ago to the day actually, yesterday, two years ago, I proposed to Nikki, and so we've been engaged for two years, and uh, so we we had planned to get married reasonably soon. Uh, so I said to Nikki, what do you want to do for a wedding? When do you want to get married? And so on, all the usual questions. And she said to me, look, I've been married before, but you haven't, so it's up to you. You can choose. And she said, the only thing I don't want is I don't want a long engagement. And I said, oh, no, no worries about that. What could possibly happen that we won't be able to get married next year? Uh, and she goes, oh, well, you're the futurist. You should know. And uh, so, you know, things are best laid plans and so on. Um, but and for a number of reasons, we haven't got married. We could we could have by now. But, uh, you know, because of a little bit around international travel and having guests come from overseas, uh, there's some buying and selling property. And we decided just to wait for the market to slow down a bit and so on. Um, but we haven't yet got married. But we have thought about uh, when we do get married, where we, where might we go for our honeymoon? Um, so what I'm going to do is ask, I should like a volunteer here. And the, the two things are ideally somebody from the travel industry, because I know there's a lot of people in the travel industry in the group. Um, so first from the travel industry and that you can turn your microphone on and speak out loud. You won't have much of a speaking part, but uh, I do need to hear you speak. So if you're in that category, if you're in the travel industry and you can turn your microphone on, can you just say in the chat room, uh, yes, please, or pick me or something like that. And uh, I'll pick somebody for this little exercise that we're going to do. All right, let's see if anyone's going to volunteer. Okay, I haven't seen anyone volunteer just yet. So I'll open it up to anybody else who wants to be a volunteer. Oh, Mari. I hope it's Mari or maybe it's Marie. Um, Mari, can you just turn your microphone on, please? And then uh, the first thing I can do is... Hi yeah, hi. Yeah, hi, so... there. hi, my name is Marie. Marie, and, uh, yeah. I work for a tour operator and we organize uh, tours to Scandinavia. And, yeah, okay. And you know, what would be a more amazing ho uh, honeymoon for you than... Um, in, in Lapland, where there's okay, snow good. and All right. beautiful, and there's northern lights. And okay, so hold that, hold that thought, Murray. Hold that thought, because what I'm going to do is ask you, and I'm going to put you in a bit of an unfair situation here, because what we've done is uh, we've, we've come up with a list of possible places that we could go for our honeymoon. Um, and uh, we haven't got Scandinavia on our list, but we've got these other nine destinations. Um, and I'm putting you in an unfair position because you don't know me and Nikki. And obviously, if we had the time to have a proper travel consultation, then we could talk about, you know, what our preferences are, where we've been and so on. But if you look at those nine destinations and you know, some of them might look odd, you might say, um, why would you pick Pennsylvania? It's because one of Nikki's old school friends lives there and that would be a great place that she'd like to visit. Um, but there's, there's a reason behind all of them. But what I'm going to ask you to do, Murray, is... Um, Choose one of them. Don't say it out loud. Choose one of those nine that you can see there. Okay. Um, don't tell anyone. Don't write in the chat room. Have you got one of them? Yeah. Okay. And just write it down. Okay. Write it down. And um, what I've also got here is I've made up a whole bunch of travel tags. So you can see Queenstown, Singapore, Switzerland, Vietnam. So I've got all those nine, the same nine that we had there. I've got them as potential travel destinations for our honeymoon. Okay, and the way we're going to do this, Murray, is you've got something in mind. I've got a destination in mind. And what I'm going to do is tap each of these travel tags at random. And uh, when you, um, and what I want you to do in your mind is spell out the word. Uh, just in your mind, don't do it out loud, but let's say it was Lapland, which is one that you mentioned. I'd be going, you'd be going L, A, P, L, A, N, D. And when I get to the last one, just say stop. Okay, are you with me? Okay, yeah, sure. Okay, good. So you've got that written down. You've got the destination in mind. 
I've got a destination in mind. I'll do it slowly enough that you can do it one letter at a time, but do this in your head and don't say anything until we get to the last one and then just yell out stop. Okay. All right, here we go. Oh, this one? Yes. Okay, Mari, where did you think where do you think that Nikki and I should go for a honeymoon? Oh, I was thinking of Queenstown. Really? Yes. That's exactly what we were thinking of as well. <laughs> All right, anyone who wants to unmute and congratulate and give Mari, Mari a round of applause for being a great uh, travel agent, please do that. <laughs> uh, all right. Okay. So great, fantastic. Uh, I'm going to just turn off microphones here and uh, Okay, I'm going to tell you how it's done, uh, but I'm sure there are some smarty pants in the room who already know how it's done. Uh, so if you think you know how that's done, can you please type in the chat room how you think it's done? Um, and by the way, I should say it's not because I'm a real futurist and I can tell you what's coming up in the future. Uh, it's also not because Murray and I know each other. Uh, we've, we've never met before. Um, but anyone who wants a trip to Scandinavia, I, I can recommend somebody now. Uh, does anyone know how that was done? Okay, let me explain it to you. Uh, okay, so here's how it works. Just checking chat room. Ah, oh, yeah, Jill's got it. Yeah, they all have a different number of letters. Uh, Melissa says he had a predetermined order of pointing to tags, ordered them in the way that the correct number of letters. Mike says different number of letters. Exactly right. Okay, so let me just explain that for everyone. Uh, so um, I took uh, this old by the way, these are real destinations that Nikki I, and I are interested in going to, uh, but I very craftily chose them, so they each had a different number of letters. Fiji is the smallest one with four letters, so the first three didn't really matter where I tapped, but I had to make sure number four was Fiji, five was Paris, six was Broome, and so on, so that uh, Queenstown, which had ten letters, I would end up on that one. Okay, so all I had to do was memorise the order of the cards when they were face down. Uh, actually, to let you know, I didn't even have to memorize them because I had this little cheat sheet here so that I could quickly look at them and make sure that I was doing them in the right order. Um, okay, so here's my point. Often when I speak at conferences, and I do a lot online now, but some in person, and when I speak at conferences, uh, people come up to me afterwards and ask me questions because I always invite them to do that. Come and have a chat and ask me some questions. And the two questions they always ask me, and one of them is about this. They, they say, what do my kids need to study at school or at TAFE or at uni so they'll have a guaranteed job in the future? And the answer to that, I always say, it's not only about jobs, it's about skills. Because if you're trying to predict what jobs are going to exist in five years time, 10 years time, 15 years time, you've got no chance. And absolutely, get them focused on a particular job now because that's what they need. But as much as you give them that deep expertise in that job, get them thinking about the broad skills that they need for the future. And what's that got to do with this? It's that every time I touched a card or a tag, uh, I didn't know what Mari had chosen. I didn't know when she was going to say stop, but I did know that whatever she said, I would have a winner. It would always win. So because I always picked things and I was always touching the, the right card, even though I didn't know what the future was going to hold. So there's some skills that are going to be transferable and that are going to be useful for us in our future, uh, regardless of what jobs or careers we have. And of course, that's um, always been true, but it's more true now because people are changing jobs so frequently, jobs come and go. Artificial intelligence is going to change the jobs that we're going to have in our future. So a lot of things are changing now. Um, so I'm going to share with you what the World Economic Forum has, uh, has outlined for the next five to ten years. What are the skills that we need for the future? But before we do that, I reckon, you know, there's a smart enough, uh, we've got a smart room here. Uh, let's do another poll. What skills? Fantastic. And thanks for doing this so promptly as well. Let's see what we've come up with. Great, great. I think there's a number of them which have been very popular. Probably the most popular one is critical thinking. 
Yeah, interesting. So critical thinking, I think, is number one in, in our room here, uh, which interestingly is uh, very high on the list of the World Economic Forum's list. And we've got, yeah, flexibility, adaptability. Great. OK, let me let me share with you what the World Economic Forum says uh, in terms of the, the skills for the future. And actually, we've got most of them. Um, I should let you know. So as I said, it's a smart room. Uh, so they, they, they do this uh, research. They publish this report every few years. Uh, this is the most recent one, which was published last year. And they do this globally and they do this uh, locally in regions and in countries as well. So what I'm sharing with you here are the top six skills for Australia. And they're pretty similar to the top six skills globally. Um, a couple of them have changed order, but they're pretty similar. And um, the first one here, and this is in order, uh, is uh, this, this idea of problem solving, that you do have the ability to look at a problem, innovate, and find a solution. So if you've done things like design thinking, that also falls into this category. And um, the next one is the skill of being a learner, being an active learner, which is what we're talking about today, in fact. It's about learning, relearning, even unlearning things that used to be true, but aren't necessarily true anymore. And um, the next one is the skill of critical thinking, which is the one that came up as number one in our poll. So critical thinking, it's kind of logical, scientific thinking, like trying to take emotion out of it and being able to do uh, it's about decision making. So you know, did, did Gladys take too long to lock down Greater Sydney or now the fact that Victoria locked down immediately and is doing as badly? Does that mean that she wasn't necessarily wrong? I think that's true. She wasn't necessarily wrong. Um, but how do you make those sort of that judgments and how do you make those those sort of decisions? So this, this one's about decision making. Um, the next one is about leadership. And I really like that it's not just leadership, but it's leadership and influence. So uh, you're not just a leader because you've got leader on your business card, on your job title, or because you've got the corner office. Uh, you're a leader because uh, you influence people around you. Um, it doesn't say social media influence, it just says social influence. So online influence can be part of it, but it's really how, how influentially are you to the people around you in your team, your organization, and in your community. Um, and this is particularly uh, important for um, the younger the younger generations. So generation and generation Y and generation Z, um, you're not a leader because you say you're a leader. You're a leader because we say you're a leader. That's their attitude. Um, so how influential are you as a leader? Um, the next one here, uh, IT I saw was very high in our poll, is technology skills and that competency of, you don't have to be an IT geek, uh, you don't have to be a real tech whiz, uh, but you have to be competent with using technology, communicating with technology, being okay with uh, learning new technologies and um, you know, embracing new technologies, being willing to switch if something better comes along. Um, and the last one is the idea of emotional intelligence, which also came up in our poll. Um, a lot of people think that emotional intelligence is about uh, interpersonal skills and uh, things like empathy and teamwork and diversity and inclusion. It is that, and that's half of it. The other half of emotional intelligence is understanding yourself. So it's about intrapersonal as, as well as interpersonal skills. So those are the six, the, the six top skills that the World Economic Forum identified as the, the, the top emerging skills to be fit for the future. Um, and the one we're focusing on today is around active learning, but of course the others are important as well. Um, I'll give you the chance later on, we'll talk about uh, uh, how to integrate those skills uh, into your into your life, into your personal life, your professional life, and your team's life. Uh, but just at the moment, uh, any interesting thoughts, any uh, thoughts, comments, insights that you want to share in the chat room about any one of those skills? So again, like problem solving is the first one, uh, the skill of being an active learner, uh, critical thinking or decision making, and um, leadership and influence, um, technical competency and the idea of emotional intelligence. So you're uh, understanding yourself and basically understanding the motivation behind other be others' behaviours and understanding others. Um, any comments on, around that? We will get the chance to talk a little bit more about that later. Uh, yeah, so Jack says something interesting. Most of the skills are not taught at school. Um, certainly not necessarily intentionally as part of the curriculum. They are taught in, um, you know, in in teaching some of the other course uh, course subjects as well. But uh, look, I agree. I think it's uh, uh, not not enough emphasis is given to them. Uh, Sharon says your point on unlearning as well as learning is important. Absolutely true. 
absolutely true. And uh, this also comes back to decision making. Like people sometimes make decisions too weighted. Their decisions are too weighted on the past and their previous experience rather than on the future. Uh, Lisa, networking. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely right. And that comes under both influence and emotional intelligence. Okay, let me look at the next one um, because skills are one thing and it's absolutely uh, critical to have the skills for the future. But I also want to look at the second area, the second learning strategy is also build different mindsets for the future. And mindsets are different from skills. So skills are some things that you learn and you acquire and you keep learning and you keep building them. But also, what sort of mindset do you have when you're thinking about the future? And what I'm going to share with you is some work that was done by, by Howard Gardner and he talked about this where well, he wrote this book called Five Minds for the Future and if Howard Gardner uh, sounds familiar to you if the name sounds familiar he's a guy who popularized the idea of multiple intelligences uh, so the idea that there was more than just IQ and he listed about eight or nine different intelligences uh, Daniel Goldman came along a few years after that took two of them intrapersonal and interpersonal and combined them and he called that emotional intelligence so if the name Howard Gardner is familiar it's possibly because of that. Uh, this book is less well known and this book is uh, it's around five mindsets for the future. He calls it five minds for the future. I like to think of them as five mindsets for the future. So what I'm going to do is go through those five mindsets for you. Let me sketch them out for you and we'll so we'll do it um, uh, one at a time and as I'm doing it I'd like you to think for yourself and do this for yourself for each of those five if you were to rate yourself from one to five, you could say zero to five, but I'm happy to go one to five because I think we've all got some of them. If you were to rate yourself from one to five in each of them, how would you rate yourself? Okay, and the idea is not that you're trying to get five out of five in all five. The idea is to identify your strengths and identify your weaknesses. And we're going to do a poll later where I'm going to ask you which are your strengths so we can just see in the room what strengths we've got represented in the room. But apart from that, it's completely private, confidential. So I'm not going to ask you to share in the chat or share with anybody else. So, you know, be honest with yourself and be a bit tough on yourself if you need to be. Okay, so here are the five mindsets for the future. Let me start with my very accurate dep depiction of a human brain. Uh, okay, so let's hear the five mindsets. So this one here, the first one, um, I don't like the word that Gardner used for this one, but I'll use it. Uh, so if you think of this as an academic mortarboard. Uh, so he calls it, the first one is the disciplined mind. And the only reason I don't like that one is because when you think, when you hear the word disciplined, you think this is the person who's really disciplined, focused, uh, doesn't get distracted easily, but that's actually not what he means. Uh, what he means by this is that we've all got some expertise in some area of discipline, either because we studied it or we've got a lot of experience in it. And uh, the disciplined mindset is the one that's always looking at making sure that you're up to date in whatever discipline you're working in at the moment. So Mari, in Scandinavian travel is always looking at what's new in that area, what's new in tra not only in destinations, but also what's new in travel, what technology is available to help customers, and it's in that area of discipline. So for what, whatever your area of discipline is, uh, are you constantly learning, relearning, unlearning? So on the weekend, I went to a virtual rea reality exhibition so I could test out and see the latest in virtual reality technology, which has improved a lot since the last time I tried it at an exhibition about three or, three or four years ago. So that's a disciplined mindset. And the next one here, uh, okay, again, I don't like the word, the word that Gardner uses. In fact, uh, I'm going to use my own. So this is the connector mind. Uh, Gardner, by the way, calls this a synthesizing mind or the synthesizing mindset. So the connector, and this is one of my strengths, by the way. So this, I score five out of five on this one. The connector sees an idea over here and sees another idea over here and says, I know how we could combine them to create a third new thing. Or see something in one area uh, in one industry and then says, I know how that could work in another industry. So I see something in medical imaging with artificial intelligence and say, oh, that could work in the insurance industry. Or I see something in local government 
they're using robots for uh, health and hygiene and they can say oh that that would work really well in real estate in a in a different context so that's a connector mind they see things and they can connect them in new and interesting ways so it is part of creativity but Gardner also calls a third one he does call this the creative mind um, so I admire these people. I'm not one of them, but they're the people who ideas just seem to come out of nowhere uh, and they just seem to generate ideas just seemingly out of nowhere. Uh, but I like hanging out with them for two reasons. One is because I like the ideas, uh, but second, because as a connector, uh, I love hanging out with creative people because they generate an idea and I can see how that connects to some other industry that I'm working with or some part of my personal life. This is why I'm saying you don't need to get five out of five in all of them. Um, if, you've, if you know your strengths and you can surround yourself with other people who can fill in the weaknesses. Okay, the next one. These are the people people. So Gardner calls this the respectful mind or the respectful mindset. These are the people who are always thinking about other people. We should all be doing that, of course, but these people kind of make that front and center. Uh, as I said, these are the people people, the ones who are really into teams. Um, this is where they, they think about things like diversity, inclusion, equity. Um, they think about um, even at a very small scale, somebody in a meeting hasn't spoken, so maybe we should ask her opinion uh, or maybe they're empathetic enough to know maybe we shouldn't ask their opinion in public but we can ask them in private later so they're those sort of people who are always thinking about other people um, and the last one takes that to the next level and this is the big picture ethical mindset okay and the ethical mindset uh, these are the people who are always thinking about the big picture much bigger than themselves so they're the ones who are thinking about climate change and sustainability they're thinking about what impact is this going to have on our grandchildren and their grandchildren and humankind in general and so they're the ones who are always thinking about mission and purpose and values and uh, how are we going to like how is what we're doing going to make a, going to have an impact on the rest of the world for, for better or worse Okay, so those are the five mindsets for the future. And again, I hope that as you've been doing this, as I've been talking through them, you've given yourself a rating from one to five in, in each of those five areas. If you haven't, let me just give you 30 seconds to just quickly do that now. Just jot down from one to five, five being the highest, one being the lowest, uh, which of them are your, which of them are your strengths. If you're giving yourself five out of five in all of them, it's probably not as useful and you're probably thinking a bit too, uh, too highly of yourself. Okay, and here's a last poll that we're going to run today. Uh, which are your strengths? So which of those uh, did you rate four or ideally five on? So four out of five. Okay, great. Thank you very much for doing that. Uh, so Respectful Mind comes up as the, the top one in the room here of the people who did submit a response. Um, that's quite common, I find, in the groups that I work with. It's a little bit self-selecting because the sort of people I think who come along to a presentation like this do have a str uh, do have strengths in Respectful Mind. Um, so what else do we get? So Disciplined Mind was the next one. Uh, connector was the next one. Um, just out of interest, um, and different groups are different, and of course individuals are different as well. Uh, in case you're interested, this is something that uh, I did uh, speaking at a large online conference uh, in the Allied Health Services, and there were about 800 people in the audience. It's quite a big sample size. Again, not everybody voted, but the, again, Respectful came up very high in their list, uh, which is probably not surprising given the, the sort of things that the sort of areas that they work in. Um, okay, so as I said, again, the, the idea is not that you necessarily try to get to five out of five in all of them. Um, it's rare if you were able to do that. What you're trying to do is work in your strengths and then um, surround yourself with other people who can help you fill in those weaknesses. That's not to say that you shouldn't ever uh, try to look at your uh, weaknesses and say, oh, I was a bit weak in the respectful mind or a bit weak in creative. Let me see what I can do to build that. But you don't have to. You can't given that we all collaborate and work in teams, you can look at how you can um, work in your strengths and surround yourself and find other people who can help you fill in those weaknesses. 
Okay, so that's the second area. The, the second area um, that we're talking about is this area of mindset. So we talked about skills and mindset. I now want to give you uh, one strategy that will help you like, build a build your learning portfolio but before we do that i also want to tap into uh, the, the power of the group here and i want to ask you i'm going to break you into little groups here and ask you to share what you're doing one thing so each person in the group will have groups of about four or five each person share one thing that you're doing to create a learning culture either for yourself your team or your organization and you can choose to go as um, a specific or broad as you want and let me give you a couple of examples because you don't necessarily have to do them in the, the traditional ways of doing it um, so a couple of examples I said earlier that uh, whenever I speak at conferences people come up to you afterwards and they ask me um, one of two questions I told you uh, one of them which is what should my kids study uh, the other one that they ask me is how do I get my kids off their devices and I say to them that's actually the wrong question and the solution is don't switch off lean in so absolutely the, you can absolutely uh, be uh, addicted to your devices but I think parents and uh, older people generally tend to go switch off first rather than leaning in and learning what young people are doing. And I'm saying if you've got if you've got teenage kids, you're very lucky because you've got futurists living with you. So lean in and learn from them. And it's true in workplaces as well. I think um, many organizations don't tap into the skills and talents and expertise of their younger people. So are you doing something like that? Just leaning in and learning from your kids at home. Uh, my fiance Nikki, who I mentioned earlier, uh, I should say she's not just a pretty face. She's also uh, she's a, so she's a state manager of a medical device company here in Australia. She looks after Western Australia and South Australia. And earlier this year, she was um, her team uh, performed best all around Australia, New Zealand. And uh, so the other state managers they ganged up on her. Actually, that's uh, that's not quite true. Uh, the other state managers were smart enough to say, Nikki, your team's doing really well. Can you do some informal mentoring or coaching for our salespeople in our territories? And because they could do it online using Microsoft Teams, Nikki set up some um, online just mentoring sessions where she just ran through some of the techniques that they're using in her territory. Uh, people could ask questions. Um, she got some of her salespeople also to share what they're doing. And so the organization as a whole benefited from that. Um, third example, so uh, I'm part of a group that's uh, it's called the Positive Aging Alliance. It's uh, run by the Council on the Aging in Western Australia. And we talk about, you know, aging gracefully, positive aging. And uh, recently we had a meeting and we would we had some input from people from vulnerable cohorts um, in, in the population. So things like uh, Aboriginal Indigenous people, uh, old ind Indigenous people, what are their specific problems? Uh, what else do we have? Dis people with disabilities as they're aging, what problems do they have? People in the LGBT community and so on. And one of the questions that was asked uh, to the guy who was speaking for the LGBT community, the, you know, somebody said, uh, you know, what sort of specific things can, um, let's say, older gay men, uh, what sort of insights do they have? And he said, uh, this is not the first time they've been through a pandemic. And I think that was quite uh, that kind of took us all aback because uh, we forget about the AIDS epidemic pandemic in the 1980s and uh, there's stuff that we can learn from um, people who've got very different backgrounds than we have. So perhaps one of the things you're doing for creating that sort of learning culture is actually making sure that you have got that diversity so you've got people with different lived experiences. Okay, so there are some examples. I'm going to give you... Okay, thanks everyone. Now, when I do this as a long masterclass, a uh, half day or one day masterclass, the ideas that come up in those rooms are as valuable as anything that I could share with you around some strategies because we have got such diversity in this group here, in this room. Um, but I do want to give you one last little strategy uh, that'll perhaps help you with your learning journey and help you plan your learning journey. Um, and this is something that I always teach people when you're thinking about change, innovation, or learning, because they all kind of follow the same theme. So if you're starting from point A, then I reckon there are three steps that you could take. And uh, I'm going to call them B, G, and X. So in the context of learning, you can do bit-by-bit bit learning, which is short-term learning. 
and you can set yourself to do some short-term learning. And short-term learning may be very simple. So maybe you decide that you're getting too much spam or even that your email is being overwhelmed and you've become a slave to your inbox. So some short-term learning may be, I'm going to spend some time this week figuring out a strategy to keep my inbox empty or at least not be a slave to it. Okay, and you can do that. You can do that in half an hour. You can learn a strategy to do that. So that's short-term learning. Uh, the next one is A to G or goal-oriented learning or project-oriented learning if you like, which is medium-term learning. So this might be where you say I'm going to do a course. I'm going to learn something. I'm going to do a course on something that I've been interested in. And uh, I reckon 90 days is a pretty good time, uh, time frame to give yourself to do something, uh, to do a course and then to put the learning into practice. Uh, if you want some ideas on how to do it, uh, masterclass.com is a great website. So years ago, I did, uh, uh, when they were pretty new, um, I did a masterclass, an online masterclass where it was learn comedy from Steve Martin. Um, and it's not live, but it's a set of pre-recorded videos and exercise and so on. Uh, at the time, it was, um, you paid per course. So it cost me like 100 US dollars and gave me lifetime access to it. Now they've expanded it to like a Netflix style model where you pay $30 a month and you have access to all the masterclasses on the site. And the things like learn comedy from Steve Martin, learn tennis from Serena Williams, learn critical thinking from Neil, Gr uh, Neil Grigas, Neil Grass de Tyson and so on. Uh, so there's a whole bunch of things that you can get on Masterclass and I think it's worth doing. I think it's worth doing for your own learning. And uh, the other thing I always recommend to my clients is that if you're a leader or a manager, you should be giving your team a small discretionary amount of money that they can spend on their own learning. And uh, look, I reckon you should do that for yourself anyway. Um, so that's all, the, that's medium term. And the, the last one, A to X, which is the long term, uh, where you don't exactly know where you're going to turn, uh, going to end up. Uh, but uh, and when you're talking about innovation or change, I call this a quest. So this might be five years or ten years. You, you might have some idea of where you'd like to be, and it re requires some significant changes to get there. Um, so it'll take a bit of work, but at least you can uh, take the first steps to get there. So in your learning plan, uh, put in short, medium term and long term things. Uh, don't make them all about a quest and everything's focused on that. Do some short term and medium things as well. Medium term things as well. Uh, Janine says it's a great resource. We do it as a team exercise. I wonder, Janine, are you talking about Masterclass? Because that's a fantastic way of using it. Yeah, I can see nodding there. Yeah, great. Fantastic. OK, so just to finish off. Our timing is perfect. So we talked about these three things. We talked about the skills for the future, and I gave you some idea of what the World Economic Forum says. So and I think we do need those deep skills in a particular area of discipline, but also those broad skills that are transferable across different disciplines. And we talked about the mindset for the future. And as I said, these five mindsets, you don't have to be strong in all of them, but for the ones where you're not as strong, See what you can do to, to bring people in to your team who've got those strengths. And the last one is to create those short term, medium term and long term um, goals along your learning journey. Uh, thanks everyone for coming along. My last message, uh, as with many of my presentations, is this. So don't wait for everything to be perfect. Don't wait for all your ducks to line up. They never will. And we know this, especially in the last two years, to start before you're ready, because the world won't wait for you. Um, if you want to engage with me with me more, uh, all my contact details at gihanperera.com. You can book me for doing keynote presentations, masterclasses, magic shows, no, not the last one, uh, uh, coaching, leadership programs, and so on. Uh, thanks, everyone. Uh, please take some things away from today and put them into practice today, tomorrow, and as soon as you can. Stay safe and healthy. I'll see you in the future. Thanks, everyone. Have a great day.